happy last Sunday of 2020. Aaron here and welcome to City Church Online. If you're streaming with us live, play along. If you're joining us after the broadcast, feel free to skip ahead for direct access to Sunday Online. But before we go any further, I'd love to give a shout out for our Rev Crew Youth Group. Woohoo! What's up? Join in the conversation, catch up with some of your friends or make new ones. With all that has happened this year, tell us about the best thing that has happened or even an unexpected joy that you've experienced. time together, take a moment right now to share this on social media and make sure to tag us on Facebook or Instagram at Love Hope City. tips we've been learning during this season, go to lovehopecity.com slash community. We've been having a great time getting to know folks and what their interests are through these tutorials. If you've learned a new skill during this pandemic or have something creative or fun you'd like to share with our online community, feel free to let us know in the comment section or email Pastor Krizel at krizel at lovehopecity.com. Now for today's how to. Is this thing on? The Grinch isn't around, is he? Okay, just checking. Here's a great recipe for funfetti shortbread bites. It's only five or six simple ingredients. One cup of salted butter. If you only had unsalted like I did, I added a quarter teaspoon of salt. Two thirds cup of granulated sugar. A half teaspoon of almond extract. Two and a quarter cups of all purpose flour. And three tablespoons of sprinkles. Before you start, make sure you add parchment paper onto your cookie sheet and I placed it there with butter just so it doesn't slide. You're going to place the cookie dough on here later and then have to lift it out so that's why it's on there. First we're going to cut up our butter and add the sugar and cream those together. Now add in the almond extract and with the mixer on the low setting, slowly add in your flour. Now the fun part, sprinkles. Once you mix those in, place it on your cookie sheet and start spreading it evenly. At first I use my hands 
And don't worry, I did wash them multiple times. But here you can see I am using the parchment paper to make sure it is level and even on the top. Also, you can tell that I didn't spread my dough through my whole pan. That's just because my pan was slightly larger than normal. Now, place it into the fridge for 30 minutes. Preheat your oven to 350. And now you use that parchment paper to take the dough out of the pan to cut it into bite-sized pieces. Bake for eight to 12 minutes and make sure your pan doesn't have butter or parchment paper or anything like that. Mine actually had some leftover butter. So it has a crispy edge that I just trimmed right off to make sure it had that square shape. Eat them all yourself or package them as gifts. These are fun treats that anybody can enjoy. Happy baking. Movement break. Let's get up on our feet and get that blood flowing and prepare ourselves for a time of worship together. For today's movement break, I'm gonna let our favorite dudes lead us, Eddie and Elijah. For the next 30 seconds, let's turn our household chores into a TikTok dance move. All right, gentlemen, let's go. Let's start with plunging the toilet. <laughs> Washing the dishes. Folding the laundry. Ironing your dress shirts. Mowing the lawn. Mopping the kitchen floor. Clearing out the dust bunny. <laughs> you guys need more practice. Now go do them for real. we got you on your feet, pump up the volume and have your Bible and cup of coffee close by and get ready to worship together and hear a good word or two or three. Thanks for joining us. We're so glad you're here. Well, hey guys.
guys, Pastor Kyle here. We are so grateful that you tuned in for church in the final service of 2020. Man, what a year this has been, hasn't it? I mean, I know that we're all hopeful for 2021 to be some kind of improvement over 2020. And let's pray that we can return to some semblance of normal life in a relatively short period of time. But in the meantime, we're going to just have to continue to trust God to grow us through what we are continuing to go through. I want to invite all of you right here and now to fill out a digital response today, uh, whether today's the first time you're coming to City Church or whether you've been coming a long time, you can do it via the web at lovehopecity.com forward slash response, or you can do it on the Church Center app uh, by tapping the link. You have to select City Church as your church once you download the app and then tap that link there uh, for the worship response. And uh, man, we would love to pray for you. If there's something we can lift you up before the Lord, we'd love to do that. So fill that out. And while you're filling it out, I also want to let you know that we will be back to in-person outdoor services next Sunday, January 3rd. Uh, we continue to provide open seating outside in the courtyard for both 9 a.m. 9 a.m. and 11 11 a.m. times. And we'd love to see any of you who feel comfortable attending in person. And now we're going to go ahead and take our offering. We want to continue to thank you for trusting God with your finances and for trusting us to be your church. You can give him one of three simple ways. Uh, you can give via the web at lovehopecity.com forward slash give. Uh, secondly, you can give on the Church Center app that I just mentioned just a, just a moment ago. And finally, you can give via the mail by sending a check to City Church, P.O. Box 587, Anaheim, California, 92815. You know, for the last couple of years, we've done this kind of best of service where we take some of the best clips from the prior year and we show them all at the final service of the year. And so that's what we're going to do today. So sit back, relax, grab your Bible and your coffee and enjoy the rest of the service. Louder than 
although we are a part at this moment, the church is more than just a building. And so wherever you're watching this right now, let's lift our voices and sing together. Let's sing a little louder. You say, let's sing a little louder. Let's sing a little louder. thing I'm thankful for is a wife who can cook. And I'm thankful for fresh produce. One thing I'm thankful for during this season is just having the time to hang out with my girls. One thing we are thankful for during this time is going to bicycles. We're so thankful for our online services that we can watch in the comfort of our own home. And so grateful for such a talented worship team so we can praise our Savior. Uh, one thing I'm grateful for during the season is uh, being able to work from home. We are so thankful for the time spent that we've had here as a family. Something I'm thankful for during the season is just all the extra time that I have to spend with my husband and taking my dog on walks. Something that I am thankful for during this season is just being able to wake up and open the Bible and being able to be closer to God and closer to Jesus. It's been a blessing being able to wake up and not having to worry about an alarm and having to worry about getting up and getting ready for work or getting ready for the day. I can open my Bible and just relax and rest. I'm Patty. And I'm Brian. Hey, one thing we're thankful for is that we have the electronics at our church 
that our pastors are able to record both the worship and the message so that in these times when we have to shelter in place and our church has to close its doors temporarily, we can still enjoy our Sunday services together. Enjoy. Hey, City Church family. My name is Melissa Ferguson. We have been talking about coping with COVID-19. And not only am I dealing with that, I'm actually walking the path of chemotherapy for colon cancer that has spread to my liver. And because of that, I'm not allowed to have anybody with me during treatment. And I know that this is hard, but I'm still leaning into God. There are things that have helped me be an overcomer, just like you can be an overcomer. First of all, prayer, having a direct line straight to Jesus. It's the best thing. Secondly, worship, praising God in this storm. So let's just give him a shout of praise because no matter what we're going through, praising him will take away the fear.
just people that are coming through the parking lot, uh, you know, line down the street of cars that are rolling through. They come through here, we get, they open up their trunks, and uh, we've got some awesome volunteers that come and just stuff their trunks with food. And so it's an amazing thing that we can do to provide uh, physical needs for people. But not only that, at the end of the line, there is a prayer uh, team that prays with these uh, people that come in here, and so we get to, uh, to engage them spiritually as well. And so far, at this moment, and there's still two more hours to go, there have been 54 decisions for Christ. And so God's doing an amazing thing. So thank you, City Church, for partnering with uh, what's happening here, and uh, God's doing a great thing this community. Pray with me. Father, we thank you for the dawn of a new year, of a new decade. And Lord, we ask that you would just really honestly, Lord, just bring a double portion of the blessing that you uh, gave to us in 2019 and in the first 10 years of ministry uh, in this year and beyond. Lord, I pray for every person here in the seats today, that each and every single one of us would make this the year when you are our top priority in everything in life, when you are the very center of everything that we do. And Father, I believe that from that will come everything that we need and more. Lord, open our eyes to see what you want us to see from your word. Open our ears to hear what you want us to hear from it. And open our hearts today that we would respond and become the disciples you want us to be because of it. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Here's the thing, though. How many of you have ever noticed that sometimes you don't feel like doing what God wants you to do? Anyone else there with me? It's called Monday. And Tuesday. <laughs> Wednesday or, you know, maybe Sunday on the drive home from church. I don't know how long it takes, but it, it just finds its way into our lives so quickly. So yeah, you know, the best kind of obedience, it flows straight out of your heart. It's natural. It's a loving response, but God doesn't care sometimes whether we felt like obeying him or not. God just wants us to obey him regardless of how we feel about it. See, sometimes we have to trust God and obey him, even if it feels like the opposite of what feels natural for us. The best illustration for obedience that I have ever heard has to deal with aviation. When a pilot is flying his or her plane and they begin to go into a stall, the natural feeling for every pilot is to pull up on the stick because if the plane starts to sputter and the engine starts to lose airspeed, you start to think to yourself, we're gonna go down there. I wanna stay up here because I don't wanna go meet Jesus yet. I love him, but I'm not ready right about now. And so the natural inclination is pull up, pull up, pull up. But that will only further the stall. Every experienced pilot quickly is taught that principle that the way to get out of a stall is completely counterintuitive. See, instead of pulling up on the stick, what you actually are supposed to do to get out of the stall is to point the nose down and go into the stall so that the plane can begin to descend, pick up airspeed, and then as it picks up airspeed, you can level off. You ever been in a plane where you feel your stomach kind of go up a little bit? You guys ever had? That's what they're doing. They're leveling off uh, through a stall when something like that has happened. And here's the deal. Obedience is sometimes exactly like that. See, the best kind of obedience is the kind that flows out of your heart and feels natural. But there are times where God says, this is what I want you to do. Point the nose down into the stall. This is how I get you out of this situation. And you just close your eyes and say, God, this feels awful, but you say I'm supposed to do it. So here we go. And so sometimes trusting and obeying God feels like the opposite of what's natural to us. Effective immediately, we're canceling in-person Sunday morning services and moving to an online-only model through the end of March for sure, in accordance with the guidelines issued by the state of California. Some of you might be asking, why are we doing this? Well, simply put, we're doing this because we care. God's got us and God's got this. This is a storm. 
Jesus might still the storm. He might ask us to hunker down and hold on to each other while it pours. It might seem like Jesus is asleep in the boat as the water continues to build up inside. But if Jesus is in our boat, we will get safely to the other side. This is a unique opportunity for all of us to trust in the Lord. We don't know what tomorrow will hold, but we know the Lord is with us in every storm. We are experiencing a disruption in our life right now. There's disruption in school, schools are being stopped, uh, work is, is, is being uh, disrupted in certain ways, our life rhythms are being disrupted. But this can be a time when you go, all right, I'm gonna let this di disruption in my life be a time when I can focus on more devotion to God. It's really a matter of, are you gonna seek it? You know, Jer Jeremiah 29 verse 13, it says, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord. And so I promise you, if you seek God during this moment of disruption, He will meet you. And if you are able to silence all the noise that's going on and focus on Him, you know, turn off the television, put down the phone and pick up your Bible and read His Word. Spend those times in prayer. Uh, get into those alone times. You know, Jesus modeled this for us as He would go to the Garden of Gethsemane. He would meet and pray with the Lord habitually. Start creating those rhythms again and God will meet you there. So we imagine that most of us are doing a lot of remembering right now. I mean, yeah, right? We're all remembering the good times, remembering how life used to be, remembering what it is like to be with other people other than Micah in my house and John, but remembering a time other than right now, right? We're remembering too to wash our hands, to not touch our face, Remembering that we got to stay home where it is safest for the majority of us. And so last week, Pastor Kyle, he shared from Psalm 91. And there's a song from my childhood from Psalm 91 that uh, I don't know when it came out, maybe the 60s or 70s, but it was um, based off of Psalm 91. And it goes something like this. He that dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. If you remember, would you sing it with me now? <laughs> he that dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. But I just love, love that song. And it's just in this whole season of dwelling at home, that song and that psalm has been a song in my heart. <laughs> City Church. <laughs> All I want to do is hear Kyle tell a couple of jokes. I just I want to hear Chris Sale sing live. I just want to give Austin a hug. I just want to see Pastor Obi play one of his favorite lutes. Ha <laughs> <laughs> ha! Yes.
The light's not thinking about the darkness or the shadow it casts. A heart that's planted in forgiveness doesn't dwell in the past. So why should I be? Cause you take good care of me. their struggles with someone. And see, here's why this matters. Whoever I share my struggles with is whoever I allow to speak into my struggles. You know, and I was going to make this point, this question, uh, who are your five closest friends? That's how I was going to word it. But I knew that some of you would be like, I don't have five close friends right now. (laughs) When really you do, you know, Uh, and the fact is this, every one of us shares our struggles with someone. And the, and the problem with the question I wanted to ask was that those of us who have been walking with Jesus for any length of time uh, know how to, you know, write down the five people we'd consider friends in church. So you think about, oh, here are my five favorite church friends, and you write their name down. When in reality, the five people who you're actually currently sharing your struggles with might be totally different people. Um, and so the fact is this, our closest friends aren't always the ones we'd write down on a paper in a church service. Our closest friends at any given point in our lives are the people that we're sharing our struggles with. And whoever we're sharing our struggles with are the people that we're allowing to speak into our struggles. Um, And sometimes that's a hard reality to look at who we're actually sharing with because the fact is we're greatly influenced by the people who we share with. Um, And I think we're also pretty good at deceiving ourselves sometimes into thinking that the people that we're sharing with aren't influencing us in different ways. Um, And so if we are sharing things with people 
who aren't in tune with the Lord, knowingly or unknowingly, we're allowing their influence to speak to us on some level. And you know, for a little while, that can be no big deal, but it doesn't often become a big deal until bigger issues start to come up. And I guarantee you, you will find this principle to be true in your life, that whoever you share your struggles with is the person who you're eventually going to allow to speak into your struggles. You know, you wouldn't be very likely to go to a gym where the trainers were all out of shape and messed up, right? You, you want to see what the example is and say, okay, I, I could see that for my life. Well, here's what I'm going to tell you now. You shouldn't get marriage advice from somebody who's going through a divorce right now. And I'm about to ruffle some feathers here from the church pulpit. Is that okay with you guys? Not all advice from family members is good advice. have control over your emotions when you communicate. Now, if you're not in a space where you can do that, uh, know that it's okay. You need to take some time off to cool down. So there's a point when communicating in anger gets just completely unproductive and, um, and it actually gets dangerous and hurtful. And so if your conversations get to that point, know it's okay to press the pause button to take a time out and have a cool down period for both of you and then reschedule a better time to revisit this conversation. And I want to say it really does work. Um, Obi has used this with us multiple times. I think it happens mostly in the car where we're driving and we're really happy and then all of a sudden we're arguing about something. So the disagreement just gets heated and then Obi usually would just say this conversation is not being productive anymore so let's um, he'll pull the timeout card he'll say let's push pause and revisit this later when we're, we're cooled down. Honestly, I'm really annoyed every time he says that because I have stuff to say, you know what I mean? But, um, but I respect him and looking back, there's so much wisdom in it and it's really, really saved us from getting into heated fights and fights to get out of hand. Yeah, um, I love what a friend from church, uh, he, he shared with us at a small group one time. He said, we need to learn how to build a speed bump between our brain and our mouth. And man, that is, there's so much wisdom in that. Psalms 12, uh, 141 verse three says, set guard, O Lord, over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips. We need to think about the words that leave our lips. Uh, and we need to think about the emotion that is that it's sent out with because words that are said in offense are received in defense and so that completely nullifies communicating clearly if that happens so we need to have control over our emotions
in this passage of scripture. In the book of Exodus, God called Moses to fight for the freedom of the people. That freedom is still available for us today. God brought my family from the dark into the light, from a dry place to a promised land. I know how far he's brought us, and if he can do that with us, he can do that with you. Here's my story. You stepped into my Egypt, and you took me by the hand. You marched me out in freedom, straight into the promised land. Okay, so my goal in this next section is literally to slightly frustrate every single one of you from different political persuasions with the purpose of bringing us all together in the end. Our current pandemic that we're in is causing dissent and disagreement on a whole new level. Some people think that this whole pandemic is a hoax created by Democrats to get Trump out of office. Some people acknowledge that the pandemic is a real thing, but they think it's overblown. Some people think that the pandemic is a real thing, that it's not overblown, but that the government response to it is overblown. Some people think the pandemic is a real thing, and not only is the government response overblown, but that governments are becoming oppressive and using this pandemic to take away our basic freedoms like where we go and having the freedom to go where we want and even that freedom to gather together in our churches. Now here's where this shifts. Some people think that all the people who mention all the things I just said are in denial about how incredibly dangerous this virus really is. And some people think that folks who don't take this vi virus seriously are just straight up playing with fire in terms of human lives. Some people are fearful of the virus killing people. Some people are fearful of the economy absolutely devastating people. Some people are just afraid. <laughs> And some people are afraid of our social liberties being taken away in the name of safety. But the one thing that we can all be sure about right now is that by now, we are all pandemic experts because we've read some blogs about it. Okay, now I'm just playing around with you a little bit. What's the point of all this? What's up, Mr. Motorcycle? Good to see you. The point isn't what you think about something or what I think about something or what the Republicans think about something or what the Democrats think about something or what the independents think about something or what city church thinks about something or what your uncle who's a doctor thinks about something. The, per the point is this, how does the Bible encourage Christians to respond to the world we disagree with and to fellow Christians as well? And the implication is very clear. Peter says that we are to submit to our government leaders, we're to honor them, we're to pray for them, and that it's for the Lord's sake. And for those of you who love your president, here's what you need to do. You need to start praying for your governor. <laughs> and for those of you who love your governor, you need to start praying for your president. For those of you who don't like either of them, you need to pray for them all collectively together. I told you that by the end of this section, I would take every single one of you off in a slight way. But here's the thing, Christians, 
People are never our enemies. You know, when our party is in office, we think it's pretty sweet, don't we? When our party's not in office, we often feel like we have an enemy in the public office. Church, I'm here to remind us all that our posture needs to be one of submission, respect, and honor towards government leaders. Notice I didn't say agreement. You're gonna have differing views with just about every human being on planet Earth in some capacity. It is completely okay to disagree. And in terms of the political sphere, it's completely okay to tear apart a policy that's being crafted. What's never okay is to tear apart a person. Every single person is created in the image of God. Jesus died for every one of them. A lot of people don't believe racism exists, which I am very confused about. It's just like, dude, I am telling you that I'm dealing with this and you don't believe me because of yeah. what, right? So I just want you to have people to have empathy towards other people of different races. I mean, as you can see, I mean, not going into politics, like the way you describe people makes a big difference. And, I mean, not even politics, because I have friends that are of different race. Let's just, an example, I have some Asian friends, right? So when you said, you know, the way you describe them, the way you say that certain things happen because, you know, the, like from China, it affects them and then they get affected by the community because people are actually listening. And our society create our view of people of different colors, different state, like different countries. So, so as long as we, we, need, we just need to change our point of view and put ourselves in positions of others and treat people fairly and right. Uh, don't just go by what you hear. There's a lot of white noise out there, not, not being white, but just like <laughs> noise in specific. So you, you need to turn that off, you know, close that out and just, you know, look deep inside yourself, like the humanity within you. Even if, even if you're not a Christian, yeah, which, you know, which is very important to me, even if you're not a Christian, but your humanity will tell you that something is wrong. I do think it's important to check your own heart and determine where is it that I might have some what's called implicit bias, bias that you're not even conscious of that could be affecting other people. You know, where, where could I be going wrong in my attitude, in, in my, the stereotypes that, I've, that I have towards another group of people? to where it may be affecting the way I interact with that person or how I treat that person or if I hire that person or not or if I give the person, if I'm a landlord and I, I choose not to give that person the, the apartment even though they deserved it, they were worthy of that apartment. Like where can I check myself or wh where, what can I do to check my own thoughts that I feel may have interfered in a negative way in someone else's life? same old road for miles and miles if you've been here in the same old voice tell the same old lies if you're trying to feel the same old holes inside there's a better life there's a better life if you got pain he's a pain same old fight we've all run to the things we know just ain't right there's a better life there's a better life if you got pain he's a pain taker if you feel lost he's a way He 
she's a pain taker. If you feel lost, he's a way maker. If you need freedom, I'll save him. He's a prison shaking savior. If you got chains, he's a chain. I think and I believe that some of you feel exactly how I feel. You like I are wondering how can this year get any worse? What else is gonna go wrong? Well, I wanna let you know that you're not alone. We're all in the same waters here. We may be in different boats. Our circumstances may be different. See, maybe you also experienced a loss in your family or maybe you're facing the greatest financial stress you ever felt. Maybe you lost your job. Maybe you're battling an illness you never thought you'd get. Or maybe it's your loved one that's battling that illness. Or maybe a relationship you had is falling apart or has fallen apart. Or maybe there is something that you were looking forward to and waiting so long for that just got canceled by COVID like so many other things. Or maybe you are so angry, fed up, sad, depressed with the way things are in the world right now. All I know is that in one way or another, we are all hurting in some shape or form. I wanna let you know you are not alone. This is the main point of the message uh, that I want you to grasp and understand and remember. The bridge that will move you from hurt to happy is hope. Hope is what bridges the divide between hurt and happy. And the quicker that you can move your focus from that which hurts you onto that which you can hope for in this situation, the quicker you can make your way back to happy or Makarios, blessed. You see, in the midst of your hurt, let your primary focus be hope. Let hope be the bridge that moves you from hurt to happy. Let hope be your motivator to do good. 2020 is the hardest year that I have ever lived through. How am I able to find my way back to happy after going through the most difficult trials that I've ever endured? How do I find my way back after the, the death of my mom, after the death of one of my best friends? Well, the hurt doesn't go away, but my hope is greater than my hurt because our God is faithful and his promises are true. And I know that although it hurts now, I have hope in the faithful promises that one day I will see my mom again and that she is far better in the presence of Jesus at this very moment than she is here on earth. Does it hurt? It hurts like hell and it probably will for a while. But because I have hope in a faithful creator, I'm happy. Not the kind of happy that's based on circumstance. I'm talking about Makarios happy, blessed, fortunate, happy. So how do you move from hurt to happy? Hope. The joy that Christians possess possess is not based solely on circumstances. You know, it would be awfully easy right now to look at your circumstances and me for mine and say, you know, there is no joy because this is not good, that's not good, this has happened, that has happened. I wanna remind you of something Pastor Kyle said last week. It was, it's profound. of course, everything Pastor Kyle says is awesome. So you should, you know, go back, look at it again. In fact, just cut the sermon off and go to last week and listen to Kyle again. I decide what gets multiplied inside of me. You decide what gets multiplied inside of you. You know, some of you might be sitting at home thinking that this kind of statement makes it sound like I'm saying people are in charge of their own destinies, and I'm not. Let's go back to the text and see what Peter said. Peter says we're chosen by God who picked us out undeservingly so that grace and peace could be multiplied inside of us. That is supernatural. That isn't something you and I can do on our own. That's something that God's Spirit enables every believer to do by His power. See, God has enabled every believer to have grace and peace multiplied on the inside, but God has also given believers the choice to take hold of it daily in simple, practical ways. So why don't you read the Bible? 
Why don't you read the great stories of the Bible of how God's people were passed over because they had the blood of the lamb on their doorposts? Why don't you read the story of Daniel who was thrown into a fiery furnace and into a hungry lion's den and came out unscathed? Why don't you read about David who looked at Goliath's size, but he told that giant that he was facing how big his God was. Why don't you read about Esther who God raised up for such a time as this to save the Jewish people. Why don't you read 2 Chronicles 7.14 where God says, If my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Why don't you read about Jesus as he went to the cross, even though it was the last thing he wanted to do, but he knew it was his mission all along. Why don't you read about Jesus conquering death forever, this resurrection that we just celebrated on Easter Sunday a couple weeks ago. Why don't you read about the Lord commissioning the disciples to carry on the torch of building the church. Why don't you read about the spread of the early church. Why don't you read Paul's letters of encouragement and admonishment. Why don't you read about Paul talking about his thorn in the flesh, this situation that he repeatedly prays about and asks God to take away that God never does take away. And so instead, he just has to continue to trust the Lord in spite of it. I don't know if you can tell what I'm doing here or not, but what I'm trying to show you is how to take control back of what's multiplying in your mind. It's not rocket science. It's simple. Peter wants every believer to know that the purpose of this letter from the very introduction is to see grace and peace multiplied in believers' lives. Because of what God has done, I get to decide what gets multiplied inside of me. And you get to decide what gets multiplied inside of you. Hey, if you're watching this and you've never made the decision to make Jesus the Lord of your life, I want to tell you God promises to do four things for you. He promises to forgive you of your sin, to adopt you into his family, to fill you with his spirit, and to give you an eternal life beyond anything you could ask for, dream, or imagine. There's only one catch. Jesus wants the steering wheel of your heart. And so if that's you today and you've been window shopping God and the Bible and the claims of Christianity, I believe unmistakably God brought you to this video to settle the question once and for all. It isn't mystical or magical. God's going to hear the faith as you pray with me right now. So if you're ready to commit your life to Jesus, just say this prayer with me in the quietness of your home or wherever you are. Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for my sin and the sins of the world. I believe you died there, and I believe you rose from the grave so I could have everlasting life. Lord, come into my life. Forgive me of my sin. Fill me with your spirit and give me the power to live this life for you. God, I'm tired of running. Here's the steering wheel of my heart. Would you take over? Amen.
thanks so much for tuning in, guys. We hope that you have a great rest of your week. We will be back for in-person church outdoors again next week, Sunday, January 3rd at 9.09 a.m. and 11.11 a.m. outside in the courtyard. And we'd love to see any of you who feel comfortable attending. And for the rest of you, we'll just continue to serve you online. We hope you have a great rest of the week, and uh, we will see you guys next year. Later, guys, and happy early New Year.